Since this is a very long video, I'll keep the intro and outro short. This is a theory video. I use information available in the game, but my conclusions and theories are not the official lore, unless I got something right and it's confirmed in the game itself. With that out of the way, let's start with the most detailed analysis of Fontaine version 4.0. The history of Fontaine is very long, and it's divided in different eras, each ended with a maritime catastrophe of some kind that sank whatever civilization existed at the time. Originally, on Tevat there was a special, dense sea on the surface of the planet, and most lifeforms were born and nurtured in it, but one day it would swallow back the life it gave, filtering out only the life that it didn't create. The Primordial Sea doesn't exist anymore on the planet's surface, probably because Tevat was capsized. In the Mandaean cosmology, a Gnostic religion, there is the sea or ocean of soup, the primordial sea in the world of darkness in which souls are thrown to remove their sins in order to ascend to a higher plane of existence and achieve knowledge and glory. After the fight between the primordial one and the second who came, the first era, the Envoy Age, began. The people were self-sufficient and prospered thanks to the envoys of the heavenly city that walked the earth, until the people got bored and tried to obtain powers that were not meant for them and break free from their fate. So the gods sent down gigantic waves and, after a hundred days of rain, sin and arrogation were drowned, ending this early civilization. This is identical to Salvin Dagnir's history from the tiaras of frost, flames, torrents and thunder artifacts. Since the Envoy Age ended with the descent of the Celestial Nails all over Tevat, maybe one fell on Fontaine as well back then, which would explain the shape of the mountains. In an unknown past, a god, Remus, visited the Primordial Sea, the Kingdom of Dragons, where the first sovereign gave him a goblet with Primordial Water. The god wanted to create a kingdom that lasted a thousand years, so he created golems with the Immortal Stone, or Lithos, and Ihor, the essence of Primordial Water. In Greek, lithos just means stone, while ichor is the blood of the Greek gods. Similarly, in Greek mythology, the automaton Talos was made of copper, in this case, and ichor, and he dispensed justice with laws written on copper plates, which were also used by the Remurians. Back to Fontaine, when the tides retreated, nothing was left except for a few survivors who lived as animals for eons. After Gurabad's fall, so in the middle of the Arkham War, the Sovereign of Water hadn't returned from confinement yet, whatever that actually means, so King Remus, aka Sponsian, reached the high waters from the east. He descended upon Meropes, an alternative name for Atlantis, with his golden Fortuna, probably a ship because the Roman goddess Fortuna, goddess of luck and fate, usually carries a ship's rudder. Also in Roman history, Remus is the twin brother and victim of the founder of Rome, Romulus, while Sponsian is Sponsianus, a Roman usurper. Since Remus is also called the usurper, could it be the one that Apep was talking about? The god king Remus brought civilization, art and music to the savages and, with his immoral fleet, the so-called demigods, he conquered the entire land on board of musical ships, also submitting the great dragon beneath the abyssal depths, while the Loch Knights had to hide the pure springs of water and the spirits born from them, because they opposed the new empire. Past the ocean pillars and following the royal fairway, an artificial canal, there was the Tower of Remuria that was built at the border of reality and dreams. It guided the sailors between the islands and saved them from the songs of the sirens, thanks to its bell. At the end of the fairway there was Machimos, the city of warriors, which in mythology was one of the two cities of Meropes. And lastly, Capitolium was the center of Remuria, a paradise for artists at the foot of Mount Capitolium, where only outstanding intellectuals and musicians were allowed. It hosted the Golden Palace with tall copper pillars, a giant musical instrument where the god King Remus rested, listening to every melody of his empire. If he heard discord, he plucked the strings and resolved the issues. In ancient Rome, the Capitolium was a temple dedicated to Jupiter, Juno and Minerva, and it gave the name to one of the seven hills of Rome, the Campidoglio, aka Mons Capitolinus. The Remurian seers though prophesied that discord would bring the end, and this was Fortuna, fate, so the god king composed and spread a harmonious symphony of prosperity that would have helped him escape judgement. Remus, as the Harmus of the Empire, which in Greek history was a governor of a city subjugated by the Spartans, picked four exceptional humans and made them Harmus, sharing with them his powers and authority. And we know the name of two of them. Cassiodor, a warrior who, after trials and lessons, became part of the Empire. 
His name comes from Magnus Aurelius Cassiodorus Senator, a Christian Roman statesman. Remember the name Cassiodor because he is very important. The other one was Boethius, who forsook his origins and took this name when the god king recognized his worth. Talking with the king, he realized that humans can avoid being swallowed by the primordial water through their innate ability to transcend. His name comes from Anicius Manlius Severinus Boethius, a Roman senator, consul, historian and philosopher who, with Cassiodorus, was a leading Christian scholar of the 6th century. Now Remus made two mistakes. He tried to defy fate and, even worse, he gave humans powers reserved only for the gods, which then led to corruption and revolts. So the god king mixed pure water with insoluble ichor, in order to let his subjects discard their physical bodies and transcend, obtaining eternal life and retaining their wisdom and memories. But the pain was too strong and their souls shattered, and the ichor turned black with their suffering, chaos and madness. Then he built fairways all over the empire to spread the melodies of Capitolium, the Grand Symphony of Fate, which was in reality the Golden Ichor, which slowly replaced the primeval waters of the nation. Boethius helped laying waste to the Loch Knights and the spirits of pure water. Alas, the foretold and inevitable day arrived. The Hormos became tyrants because of their powers and the native people of the land rebelled and brought destruction to the Golden Empire. They were either helped or led by the bear dragon King Scylla, the ruler of a unique brutal race of beings born in the sea, who also recruited bishops, later led by the fell dragon prince. In mythology, Scylla was a Nayas, a spirit of fresh water, who was claimed by Poseidon, the god of the sea. But Amphitriti, a Neris, or sea spirit, out of jealousy transformed her into a monster. Scylla also appears in the Odyssey as a monster that, together with Harivdis, destroyed ships. One of the Harmos, I think Cassiodor, realized that this revolt was the consequence of the way they treated the native people of the land, while another one, probably Boethius, couldn't forgive their actions and wanted to purge them all. The god king, who was in a dream, woke up and found himself in the middle of a war, so he called for his most loyal guards and most attuned musicians and gave them a final order to try and bring back the peace, but a violent flood destroyed everything. The god king played the last movement of the Golden Symphony, but his favorite musician, Boethius, stole the goblet with the ichor and, because of the king's betrayal and madness, he used the ichor to seal the king in his tall tower and the dragon king Scylla underneath it. The earth collapsed all at once and the Golden Empire sank into a chasm of eternal darkness, into the depths of the Black Abyss, just like Gurabad, while the Golden Ichor was corroded by the primordial soup. The Empire Knights then reverted back to the original form, that is golems of Lithos with Ichor in their veins, that can still be found today in the countryside. On the other hand, the fight between the archers and the descendants of the dragons in the darkest depths kept going until one last archer and one last descendant of the dragons were left. They reached a peace agreement, and some say that they betrayed their homelands and settled down somewhere. It is said that today the tuner, Remus, is still creating golems and is still playing his symphony in Capitolium, while the descendants of the Golden Troop are trying to revive the kingdom, taking children away to offer their souls to the golems in the hope of reviving them. The name Remuria comes from Anthroposophy, a 20th century spiritualistic movement that I talked about before Sumeru came out. They use the Akashic Records, the compendium of past, present and future events that exists in the mental plane, to learn about the seven root races or evolutionary steps of humanity, of which we need the first four. In the first one, the Polarian, the Earth, recently formed, was cooling down. There was a primeval ocean from which Mount Meru arose, and the civilization was ethereal. This in Genshin Impact is the Primordial Age, with the Primordial One, the City, the Primordial Sea and the Unified Nation. In Fontaine there are three references to the second root race, Hyperborean. The Lumidus Belt talks about Coppelius's play, Golden Hyperborea. The center of the world in Anne's story is also called Hyperborea. And in Ballad of the Fjords, Child's father talks about how winter comes from Hyperborea, while telling Child the story of the hero Ajax, who he was named after. This engaging impact is the Envoy Age, since the people of Stalvindagnir were trying to escape the freezing temperatures when they settled down on Vindagnir, nowadays Dragonspine. The third root race, Lemuria, worshipped divine wisdom and art. 
women wield the nature through dreams and melodies, and men had incredible strength to build whatever they wanted. In the end, a volcanic eruption decimated the civilization, and the survivors founded the Atlantean Force Root Race. Remuria worshipped art and music, Remus lived in a dream state and shared knowledge and power through melodies, and Remuria ended tragically as well. The Atlantean Root Race lived on Atlantis and was split in seven sub-races, so it represents Fontaine because Meropis and Meropida are Atlantis, but also modern Tebat in general. Atlantis had aqueducts, airships, economy, welfare, but fell when the people, corrupted by the dragon Thevetat, used black magic which caused an earthquake that sank the whole nation. The dragon Elenas released toxins, the abyss. People will use abyssal powers or even forbidden knowledge, black magic. So Fontaine will fall. Back to Fontaine, when Remuria sank, the survivors kept fighting savagely until the noble navigator, the ruler of rivers and seas and the queen of all waters, basically the soon-to-be Hydra Archon, appeared and settled the conflicts, established new cities around the flowing springs and started a world guided by laws. The first version of the core of Fontaine was born. Now, Remuria was built after Gurabat's fall, so more than 2000 years ago. It fell in one single day, and a century later, the Hydro Archon was built in the core of Fontaine. This means that she may have been among the last gods, if not the last one, to become an Archon, and she ruled for around 1500 years. Now, about the name Egeria. She appeared for the first time in the Overture, talking about the original sin. The burial region says that, centuries ago, the followers of Agaria loved the place. The tainted water-spouting phantasm says that, in Agaria's era, the Oceanids lived alongside humans and in springs of clear water, but when their god died, the survivors no longer recognized any other god. The Romaritine flower may have been a Hydro spirit in love with Agaria, which is why it blossoms with Hydro. Lastly, in the ancient natural history excerpts, there is physical evidence and records stating that the Oceanids predate both Egeria and Remuria, but we already knew about that because of the Loch Knights. We learned that the Oceanids are unique based on their life experiences and individual traits, and they increase or produce new ones without mating. When they gain enough understanding or emotion, they ask either the Hydro Archon or an Elder for permission to claim a thing, which could be a drop of pure water essence, a name that will create a new identity, or just a permit for dreams and desires to become a new life. The thing is also called a helix split, which may simply be DNA replication. The DNA is a double helix, meaning two linked strands that wind around each other. During replication, as for all living organisms, the strands separate and, through semi-conservative replication, each original strand synthesizes its counterpart to make a new helix. Anyway, the scientists from the excerpts said that if anything happened to Egeria, the elder oceanids will ensure the survival of the species. But if anything worse were to happen, then their fate may be at risk. So it seems that the cataclysm hadn't happened yet. This means that Egeria was probably either a special oceanid or she was chosen by the other oceanids to become the Archon, which would explain why they never accepted a new god after her death. By the way, Egeria in Roman mythology was a nymph from ancient Rome, and she taught her husband, Numa Pompilius, the second king of Rome, the laws and the ancient Roman religion. Now in pre-cataclysm Fontaine, there was the Fontaine Armada, and the pure white ironclad flagship, the Sponsian, was commanded by Admiral Basil Elton. The ship's name, suggested by Basil's first mate, Nathaniel Pickman, was the name of the usurper Remus. When the Sponsian broke, Basil retired and was appointed vice director of the Narcissenkreuz Institute, an orphanage built on the ruins of Remuria, that welcomed orphans and children of criminals, and the director was a gentle oceanid in honor of the Hydro Archon. The orphanage though existed before it officially became a national institution, because Basil Elton, Dwight, Carl and Emmanuel played there as kids. Anyway, one of the orphans, Alain, got close to a new little girl, Marianne, and they became basically siblings. Now, Basil's friend, Emmanuel, is a very important character in the Narcissenkreuz Institute, Fontaine and Remuria, because he was Cassiodor, one of the four harmosts of the Golden Troop, which explains why he was still alive 1500 years after the fall of Remuria. 
Cassiodor became a member of the Marechose Phantom, an institution they used to battle against the phantoms in the dark. He was also known as the Marechose Hunter and the Golden Hunter, although the latter was humiliating for him, because of his origins in the Golden Empire. His life changed because of Eduardo Baker, an outlaw who ruled over Fleur Centre with his bronze pipe. When the Maison Gardinage purged Fleur Centre, Eduardo was arrested and taken away, but was rescued by his henchmen and occupied Poisson, so the Marechaussee Phantom was involved. A journalist, Carl Ingold, entered Poisson as a mediator in the negotiations, and he took a photo of the criminals. Eduardo and his son, Jacob, the mayor of Poisson, Renaud de Petrichot, and his son, René, the great magician Parsifal, Rosa Reed, her husband Thompson, and their infant child, and lastly Tom Alter. A violent fight led to Poisson being burned down, many people died and many children were orphaned and sent to the Nazi saint Croix Institute, among which Jacob and René, who became Alain and Marianne's friends. Because of the brutality of the Siege of Poisson, both Cassiodor and Carl retired. Cassiodor, or Emmanuel Guillotin, was severely injured, so he had to wear a mask from then on and decided to live alone for the rest of his life, while Carl accompanied adventurers in their expeditions. Now, Emmanuel, Basil, Carl and Dwight used to play together in the orphanage when they were young, and being young takes on a completely different meaning when Emmanuel Cassiodor was almost 1500 years old. I think that these four were the four Harmosts, and the unknown Dwight, last name may be Lasker, may be Boethius, who became the most famous musician of the Corps of Fontaine. Not long after the Siege of Poisson, the cataclysm happened. The Hydro Archon, with the director of the orphanage and other Oceanids, went to Canria to fight. The Spansion was rebuilt, and the vice director Basil sailed once more to fight against the monsters of the Abyss. Before leaving, she gave Jacob the feather on her hat for safekeeping, and, because the institute was going to sink, she asked Carl Engel to take care of Jacob and René, and Emmanuel Guillotin to take care of Hélène and Marianne. The Sponsian and ten other ships fought for more than a month against the abyss monster Elenas and other monsters. Elenas wreaked havoc on Fontaine and only the Sponsian was left to fight, although split in half. In the end, Basil charged for the last attack while trying to evacuate the crew, and Elenas was finally defeated, although Basil lost her life. In the Cataclysm, the Hydro Archon died with many Oceanids, and those who stayed back later went to the Vorukash Oasis only to find the Amrita Pool, and never came back. Only the director returned, and she spent the rest of her life in the sunken Assisenkreutz Institute. Elenas' toxins tainted the water, which now spawns tainted elemental spirits. New oceanets will never be born again unless some pure water was kept safe from the cataclysm and was hidden somewhere. The story of René de Petrichot begins with some Remurian ruins, in which he found documents that talked about how, when a kingdom rises and falls, a new civilization will always come after. This is Fortuna, so fate. He also found similarities with his computational scheme called World Formula, which resembles the Kabbalistic Tree of Life from an old video of mine. It's a diagram with ten nodes or Sephiroth, the emanations or powers of creation of Ein Sof, the infinite, basically God before he became a god. There is though one main difference, one Sephiroth is missing and I think it's Yesod rather than Malchut. Malchut, the kingdom, is the most important Sephira because it's the goal of God's creation. In the word formula, I think it refers to the primordial one, split in four elements, the shades. Malchut is also a female emanation, meaning that the primordial one is, like I said in the past, a woman, more specifically the Ian Sophia. In Gnosticism, the Thos, God, created 30 emanations, aka apostases or Ians, 15 male and 15 female. Each pair can create a new Ian with their respective counterpart, or Zizigi, but Sophia, being the youngest, thought that she could do it without hers, Teletos, and was expelled from the Pleroma, the totality of 30 emanations. Her fears and desire to go back accidentally created Matter, also called Ili or Usia, and Soul, called Psyche or Pnevma, but also the Demiurge, the son of Chaos, who created the physical world. In the end, the host sent Christ and his female counterpart, the Holy Spirit, to bring back Sophia and give humanity the gnosis they needed to go back to the spiritual world upon death. 
In Genshin Impact, Sophia is the primordial one, who created, in this case, four shades, one of which, Fanes, is the demiurge who created that, while the fourth is Fate. As for Christ and the Holy Spirit, I bet you know who they are. Back to René, his world formula gave one single result, the end of the world. In a few hundred years, the birthing waters will have dried up, and a few more hundred years later, the apocalypse would come, and only something that doesn't belong to the system would be able to prevent it. René also found some Remurian magical techniques called Seal of the Chemical Marriage, which consisted of two parts. This comes from the 1616 book called Schumische Hochzeit Christiani Rosenkreuz Anno 1459, or Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreuz, one of the three manifestos of the Fraternity of the Rose Cross, which was an important book for alchemists because of its symbolism and rituals. The two parts instead are the central process of alchemy, the solve et coagula, dissolve and coagulate, which also represents the destruction of a person's ego before the realization of the true self. Another important symbol in the book is the Monas Hieroglyphica, invented by the Magus and core astrologer of Elizabeth I of England, John Dee, and it represents the unity of all creation by celestial forces, the Monad, which brings knowledge and truth through meditation. The Thos, the Gnostic god, is also called the Monad. Back to Fontaine, René and Jacob sneaked inside the remains of Elinas because eating Elinas' flesh enhanced Jacob's inhuman strength so much that he didn't even need to eat anymore. And when Alangi Yoten, unaware of these experiments, invited them to the Institute of Natural Philosophy where it worked, René saw an opportunity to make some progress. Back then, Alain was studying the Dachri machines, ordinary room machines, and then the Persina spike we saw next to the Ring Raider, but also the Prime Energy machines, the Shred's primal constructs, and he realized that they were driven by the elements in the ley lines. In the meantime, René's next goal was to open a passage, like in the Canrian's records of the past, meaning rifts to the abyss that spawned the rift towns he saw in the Vorukash oasis, and they had similar properties as Elena's. Now, thanks to Alain, René and Jacob joined the Institute as Alain's assistants on his new Numosia research, which eventually revolutionized Fontaine, but also explained the differences between Fontaine's bodies and Carl's. If he isn't harmless, like I think, then Remus's power may have physically changed him. René then created the Book of Esoteric Revelations, that allowed people to enter a dreamscape, also accessible through the looking glass, that showed the results of his research, the apocalypse. At this point, René's new goal was to transform people like he did with Jacob, surviving the apocalypse as a consequence. Small curiosity. In the dreamscape, if you look through the purple crack in the wall, you will see the fountain in the upside down city in the chasm, which shares the same unified nation architecture of Encalmia, although the usual golden rocks here are blue. But why can we see that fountain? Anyway, Marianne, Alain, René, Jacob and Carter, Alain's assistant, went on a field research near Petrichot, where René found Remurian ruins, stone statues and a damaged map. When he learned that Carter, who was older than Alain but came from the Nazisenkreuz Institute as well, had a severe condition, he stopped working with Alain and focused on his research. He obtained some scarlet quartz, Durin's decaying body from Dragonspine, and oozing filth from the chasm, both having similar properties as Elena's flesh. Only what René calls neo-humans like Jacob or a hypothetical person who could purify these toxins could survive them. To receive fundings for his research, he used the Book of Esoteric Revelations to persuade some scientists, who became believers. So he created a secret society, the Narcissenkreuz Ordo. Because there was no cure for Carter's condition, Jacob convinced René to turn Carter into a new human, but although Carter agreed, everything failed and he kept deteriorating, which meant that Jacob was a unique case. René preserved Carter with a Remurian seal and did some things that actually disgusted me when I read them, but everything grew back in a few days. He was then left in some ruins from the Unified Nation where a treasure hoarder later found him. Alain, still unaware, was now studying kinematics, because he wanted to build a thinking machine dog to help his sister in her job as a Marechaussee phantom agent. René and Jacob instead returned to Petrichot where they discovered the origin, the water of the Primordial Sea, which explained why Fontanians were different, and gave him a new goal. 
ascend people by dissolving them in the water, like the Remurians did in the past, unaware that those experiments actually failed. They went to the Narcissenkoitz Institute where they realized that it was built on an ancient Remurian facility. There, Jacob left behind the feather that Basil gave him for safekeeping, where Rene acquired a useful script about the sword or key that carries the will of countless people, which was necessary to create Remus's golden ichor. Its constituent elements were a circle of four orthens, a tree of emanation, and a seal design. In geometry, as far as I've understood, an orthant is a slice of a circle divided in eight parts, while the tree of emanation is the Kabbalistic tree of life from before. René found the location of the ancient seal at the center of the circle, where he also found a slate replica confirming that the rising waters were the beginning of the apocalypse, and he slowly found the locations of the four orthants, which ironically were places he and Jacob often visited when they were young. Almost ready for his plan, he invited Marianne where he was building the Narcissenkoitz Ordo Hall that he defined as Gestalt, which comes from the Gestalt Psychologie or Configurationism, a 20th century school of psychology that focuses on perception. According to this, organisms perceive entire patterns or configurations, rather than their individual components. The easiest way to explain it is the painting En Dimanche Après-Midi à l'Île de la Grande Chatte by Georges Seurat. What you see is a normal painting of a scene and not the countless little dots of colors that compose it. Now since the four orthans were finally almost rebuilt, the last thing René needed was the sword, and for that he needed the director of the Narcissenkoitz Institute, the only oceanid he could find. The sword was something precious inside the director, who started deteriorating after he took it. Then René left at the institute the pocket watch that Alain once gifted him, because his personality would have soon disappeared, and proceeded with his plan. He used the sword and activated the reversing process to prevent the apocalypse, that will eventually allow all Fontanians to shed their bodies and ascend, and he was the first one to do it. He dissolved himself in the water of the primordial sea. It's interesting that it's a reversing process, because this may be the reason why primordial water suddenly started dissolving people rather than giving them life. Since René dissolved himself, the author of the last enigmatic pages is unknown. The 11th page sounds like René left this person his research for them to understand the plan, since it sounds like he's reading and learning things that René knew and gave an order in the end, sent Lyris and Jacob to, most likely, Elnas, like it said in the last enigmatic page. Alain, in the meantime, finally built Seymour, the thinking machine, left the Institute of Natural Philosophy and was recruited in the Marechaussee Phantom by Emmanuel Guillotin to investigate with Mary Anne, most likely the Narcissenkoitz Ordo or its existence, reason why their recruitment was never made public. Now the unknown author of the last enigmatic pages absorbed free agents, which gave him both useful skills and their memories, learning that the Narcissenkoitz Ordo was being investigated by the Corps of Fontaine through unofficial investigative channels. He also learned that consciousness can be transplanted and kept absorbing people, acquiring knowledge on how Seymour was built and worked, which he thought would have disappointed René. Although Jacob got emotional because he didn't want to oppose the guillotine siblings, this person met with Alain and proposed something that he declined. This person's goal was to create a future in which there would be a place for Alain and Marianne, so he knows them both and cares about them. So who is the author of these two pages? I think it's Carter. He might have absorbed the treasure hoarder that found them, which helped him recover, and started carrying out René's final orders. So what happened next? Many people, mechanical animals, and a spirit of the primordial waters, so the director of the Narcissenkoitz Institute, went inside Elena's to find Jacob. When they met him, he showed Alain and Marianne the apocalypse in the dreamscape, and told them that he wanted to dissolve everybody in the primordial water for them to survive. A fight broke and, seeing his friends attacking him, Jacob lost control of his abyssal powers and kaboom! Many people died and Seymour couldn't protect Marianne, who was hit by the shockwave and was pierced by the debris, which also threw her in the primordial water present on the scene and she dissolved. The survivors then left in silence and no one ever came back. In the shockwave, lots of mechanical devices were also destroyed, and some of their pieces pierced Elena's body, and after a while, the Melusine were born, with those pieces as their tokens. 
my reconstruction is based on free details. And remember that Marianne saw the primordial waters, the amniotic fluid of the world, its placenta being devoured, and the world falling into complete darkness, where nothing would ever grow. So Jacob must have shown them the apocalypse and displayed the primordial water in his possession, maybe even demonstrated its use and consequences, which caused the fight to begin. She also remembers the pain of shards and impurities in her body, so she was hit by the debris from the shockwave. Marianne is now an oceanid, and we learn from Vignier that the water of the primordial sea frees people from their physical body, turning them into spirits of pure water, so oceanids. And then there's the fell dragon's monocle artifact. The hero, Alain, lost the thing most precious to him, Marianne, and decided never to believe anything that couldn't be explained through science again. He left the Marechaussee Phantom and, as most likely the director of the Institute of Natural Philosophy wrote in one of the ancient notes, he built the Institute of Kinetic Energy Engineering near Erinias because the Institute of Natural Philosophy sank. Alain kept working on machines and Numusia annihilation and, when old, he shot himself in his workshop only to disappear, leaving behind traces of something being built. He created a kingdom powered by machines and energies, and I guess he did that to recreate the happy moments of his life through something that wouldn't betray him, maybe even turning himself into a machine as well. The hero who lived too long and turned into an evil dragon is, instead, Emmanuel Guillotin. He was 1500 years old and did a lot for Fontaine, even evil deeds. He died embraced by water, almost like the director's hugs, regretting many things, but especially not being close to his kids. He clung to the memories of them growing up, but in the end, these memories were dissolved in the water, just like him. Maybe René showed him the apocalypse and he joined them, like he said, to be reborn one day with the power to save his children. As for Lyris, we're gonna talk about her in a few minutes. But first, who is Elinas? He was not a simple abyssal monster. He originally floated in the abyss until Ryan's daughter found him and gave him a life, just like she did with other beings before and after his birth. During the cataclysm, I think that Ryan's daughter sent her children away to save them from the destruction, so they left the world beneath the earth, Kanria. Elinas was childish and naive, and he didn't realize that he was involuntarily hurting the humans until he died because of Basil. Then, considering that the Melusine Mamère was born from Seymour's Artifice Clockwork Relay module, needed to recharge him with Numosia Annihilation, I think that the Melusine were born because of the interaction between Elinas and specific components rich in Numosia. Elinas also realized that either cannot be poisoned by his blood, and that he was able to link with Elinas and the Melusine's consciousness. This may mean that either is not just immune to the power of the abyss, but he can actually resonate with it, just like with the elements. Then who or what is Jacob? In theory, he's a normal kid, the son of a criminal, Eduardo Baker, but Elena said that when Jacob went into him for the first time, he felt a bit of the dark, cold cosmos power in him, so he was strangely born with abyssal powers. In Anthroposophy, we saw that the Lemurian men had inhuman strength just like Jacob, so maybe he's unknowingly a descendant of the Lemurians. Lastly, Seymour's serial number is 4ACV07, which is the production number of Futurama Season 5 Episode 2 called Jurassic Bark. An extremely sad episode that I actually remember watching as a kid, entirely focused on Fry finding the fossil of his old dog, Seymour. Then the amount of clockwork cycles Seymour has been in hibernation for, 1 7th times 10 to the power of 21, equals 142857 over and over again, which is the cyclic number in base 10, that was used to build the Neogram of Gurdjieff, one of the symbols used in early 20th century by the Armenian mystic and spiritual composer George Ivanovich Gurdjieff, in order to teach his students what he called the work, later known as the Fourth Way. Basically, humans' personalities trap their souls which become dormant, and upon the death of the physical body, the souls go nowhere. Through Gurdjieff's teachings and sacred dances, the soul is awakened and upon death, it goes elsewhere. This is very similar to the people of Fontaine, who feel trapped in their physical bodies until they are dissolved. 20 years ago, a Snezhnaya man called Vache and a Fontanian adventurer named Vignier fell in love and she probably got pregnant. 
During one of their adventures, they encountered an unknown substance, and curious, Vignere touched it, thinking nothing of it, but she was dissolved right in front of Ashe. Since Vashe was Nezhnayan, he couldn't dissolve like she did, so he dedicated his life to bring her back. Later, he met Jacob Ingold, who, well aware that the solution was irreversible, gave him some research papers. To test Jacob's conclusions and reverse the dissolution, Vashe started abducting and dissolving women, unaware that this was exactly Jacob's goal, dissolve as many people as possible. Now, primordial water looks extremely peculiar. We already knew that it was dense, but it also flows upwards. Since the vat was capsized, and we have clear proof of this in the chasm, the primordial water, just like the fontaine in the Upside Down City, is essentially flowing the right way, as it originally did. Don't be mistaken though, in the chasm that's just normal water, but probably a product of the primordial water just like everything in the vat. Something also interesting is that, in Vashay's underground facility, we can find the same statues, although in modern style, of a woman holding a bowl, just like those in Economia and in the chasm. Even the vegetation is the same as the one in Economia. But there's also a new statue holding a unique sword, the same as the Hadro Arkans, and with a halo behind her head. Now, in the present, Jacob tried to buy the artworks of the Medusin Mamer, because he needed Elinas' blood, which was used as paint, to get stronger, but because we intervened, he was forced to choose a more direct approach and went inside Elinas for the first time after 400 years, either because of what happened in the past or because it was now inhabited by the Medusin, or a combination of the two. He set up seals or arrays to open rifts to the abyss to receive enough power to revive Elinas' heart, the best place to gather blood. Above ground you most likely found huge versions of these arrays, with various Latin inscriptions. The smaller section, the pentagon, says Opera Rotas Sator Arepo Tenet. This is the Sator Square that contains five Latin palindromes, that is words, sentences or patterns in this case, that can be read backwards and forwards and they will always say the same thing. It was first discovered in Pompeii, but after a hundred years we still don't know what it means. But the individual words mean labor, wheel, sower, arepo, which is not a word and has never appeared in any Latin text other than this, and hishi it holds. The middle section, the heptagon, says Corax, Lympha, Miles, Leaena, Messor, Faos, this is a Greek word, and Pater, meaning crow, water, soldier, lioness, harvester, and father. These, although slightly different, are the decrees of initiation of the cult of Mithras, an ancient mystery Roman religion defined as a rival of early Christianity. The original degrees are Corax, the crow, Nymphus, the bridegroom or male bride, Miles, the soldier, Leo, the lion, Perses, the Persian, Heliodromus, the sun runner, and Pater, the father. Nymphus became Lympha because it sounds like Nympha, a water spirit. Perses' symbol is the sickle, a harvester or reaper's tool, and Heliodromus' symbol is the torch, so light. Now Mithras was a god of justice, but in an ancient Greek religion called Orphism, Mithra was an alternative name for Phanes, the primeval deity born from the cosmic egg at the beginning of creation, just like in Before Sun and Moon. The text in the bigger section of the seal, the circle split into seven sections, is very recurrent in Genshin Impact, but also something I fully analyzed a year ago. This is such a throwback, tell me if you remember this. It reads, Ex culmine lucis in magno elementorum, lux se fundat in mentes dei, meaning from the pinnacle of the light as the great one of the elements, may the light surrender to God's minds. And minds is actually plural, it's not a mistake, because it probably refers to the shades. This text can be found in Mona's big astrolabe in the version 1.1 event Unreconciled Stars, and half of it appears when the hypostases go into their seal form. You will find several different translations online. I will only say this, I don't use Google Translate, I actually studied Latin. Now why would Mona use ancient Remurian spells? Could it be that Barbaloth, Mona's teacher, is from Remuria? I guess we'll find out pretty soon. This spell can also be found on the Abyss Lector Violet Lightning's Grimoire, but it's slightly different. Ergo sum fatus abissi ergo mundo ex culmine lucis, in magno obscuritatis. Lux se fundat in mentes abisso. I am the destiny of the abyss, hence a purify from the pinnacle of the light as the great one of the darkness. May the light surrender to the minds for or in favor of the abyss. 
Anyway, Jacob is an iniquitous Baptist, a seeker of truth who once caught a glimpse of the pitch dark world beyond the skies and guides mortals to the paradise of truth. And he's not with the Abyss Order, who are ignorant primitives similar to the oppressors who saw a power that only a few can use, most likely forbidden knowledge. Instead, Jacob's faction seeks true equality, the liberation of the will. Lastly, he also said that probably when people are dissolved, only those with a strong consciousness won't be lost. Then, since he gathered enough blood, he simply left. Now, before moving on, some Melusine curiosities for you. Canotila, the Melusine who can see the truth of the world, sees Paimon as a rainbow balloon with a string that extends upward to somewhere above the sky itself. Paimon clearly shares Ether's elemental abilities. She saw Nahida in the Samsara, which was only possible with the power of Dentro, and she can freely dive and talk underwater, only possible for vision holders. So she resonates with all the elements, hence the rainbow balloon. And because Sevat is upside down, she's connected to the stars below and is flying towards the real sky above. Are we really surprised about this? Because I am not. What surprised me was, though, what Canotilla said about Ether. He is a monster that could swallow the whole world in a single bite. Canotilla also said something very interesting. The nature of things is hidden beneath them, and this nature decides their fate. If Ether's true nature is a world-devouring monster, and this is his future, things are starting to look a little grim. Verenata, the Master Potioneer Assistant, told us that truth can be created through dreams and memories, which feels a lot like a simplistic explanation of the that. Doesn't it feel like she was talking about how Herman's soul works? Lastly, still about truth, which is the real light motif of Fontaine rather than mystery, the musician Topia saw three moons after she drank Verenata's true side potion, and before the celestial nails were sent down, Tevat did have three moons, Arya, Sonnet and Canon, so the potion actually works. In this last chapter, we will talk about three important topics. To explain the Narcissus and Koit's adventure team, I need to clarify something. There are two versions of the story. One is the live-action story that we played a part in, which is based on Marianne's memories and experiences. The characters and events are real people she knew and real events that she witnessed. The other version is written in the book A Story, and this was the original fairy tale. After reading it countless times, I realized that the main narrator, the one who came up with the story, is Marianne, because she says, need to head back with that silly dog of mine, and Seymour is Marianne's silly dog, while the kid she's telling the story to is simply a little girl we don't know yet. In the original fairy tale, the dragon Narcissus is an original character, while Lyris is the little unknown girl. Al is Alain, and Ney is Renee. These two seem not to be friends in real life, so Alain and Rene had already cut ties when Marianne told the story. Jack is Jacob, while I have no idea who Kate is. He is a boy with fair blonde hair with a cool and aloof feel to him, who is always buried in books and the girl who plays Lyris doesn't consider him to be her friend. He is maybe another kid that we don't know yet. Now who is Lyris? During the Siege of Poisson, we read that Rosa Reed and Thompson were holding their infant child. This could be Lyris, who was orphaned back then. Initially, I believed that she was going to be Arlecchino, but after reading what Chitose or Momoyo said in Rito, that theory doesn't work anymore, since Arlecchino seems to be a normal human who became the knave several years ago, something between 20 to 30 years ago, after a fight with her predecessor. Maybe Lyris was simply the one who later founded the House of the Hearth and passed on her successors and orphans her mission to save Fontaine, since Marianne told Lyris that she was striving to create a future with Ney and Jack, and Arlecchino's personal goal is basically the same as Renee and Jacob. Now, the live version of the story is very different and sometimes multiple characters are different versions of the same person. Anne is an original character. She is Marianne's ideal version of herself, who is leading her friends toward the happy ending she didn't have in real life. Al is still a land, and Kate is still unknown. Petit Chou, which means little darling, not little cabbage, is Marianne, also because Al said, I am most proud of my sister. Mori is Seymour, the silly dog, while Jacob is portrayed in two different versions. He is Jack, because Anne told us that he had a good heart before Renee changed him, but he is also the evil dragon Narcissus. 
Renee is still Renee, but it's complicated. The real Renee did use evil means to reach a noble end, so similarly, Ney stole the princess's time to save their nation. By the way, when Anne told us about Renee changing Jack, those were Marianne's memories leaking because her presence disrupted the story. It's no coincidence that she didn't tell us who Renee was. As for Liris, she is the director of the Narzissenkreuz Institute, because in real life, Renee stole the sword from her, which weakened her and cut her time short. Lastly, two important things happened when we met Marianne. She told either that he looked like a prince from a distant land, just like Lilupar did in version 3.4, and when Marianne asked either what kind of flowers bloom in the, again, very, very far away places from, he described the Intavad Lumine wears in her hair. I think he was simply trying to find out if she knew about her or about Kanria because in reality, that's the purpose of either's adventures. Also, he's always said that he's from beyond this world, so it wouldn't make sense for him to say now that he's from Kanria, don't you think? Now the moment you've been waiting for, who is Nubilet? In his introduction, his constellation's name is Hidden, just like the word Vision, although he's a Hydro character, but that's because he clearly doesn't have a vision. We learn from the ancient notes, probably written by Lord Neville, the director of the Institute of Natural Philosophy, that Nevillette became the Udex around the time when both the Opera Epicles and the Research Institute of Kinetic Energy Engineering were being built. So contrary to what people think, he didn't work with the original Hydro Archon. He's been around for only 400 years. Nevillette also started doubting what justice really was when he did nothing when Callas was accused of Jack's death. So from then on, every time he had to deliver justice in a trial, it rained. It also rained when Navia, Kalas's daughter, confronted him about her father's death. And it also rained when he apologized to Kalas's grave and to Navia when the truth finally came out. Basically, every time he's in a bad mood, it rains. But why? Well, there are two main theories going around about him. He's a bishop, a direct descendant of the water dragon that can use the elements by nature, which explains his lack of a vision. The bishops come from the light realm, which explains his missing constellation. If he wasn't born in Tevat, he can't have one. Now, Aloy's introduction never said vision, because she doesn't have one, nor constellation for Nora Fortis. She doesn't even have stars because she's not from Tevat, but it's negligible. Novilet, though, is a 5-star character. He needs a constellation and stars for the whales to spend money on, so although it's a cool theory, I don't think it's right. He's the water dragon. He commands the rain, although not on purpose. He acts superior even to the Hydro Archon, because he's a primordial being. He has horns, although are they really horns? He's strong because he's top child's foul legacy, although he hadn't fully transformed yet. His introduction says, He who looks down on all that are haughty. A quote from the Book of Job when God talks about one of his most proud creations, the Dragon Leviathan, usually associated with water in games, although this specific Leviathan spits fire. Well, it's clear that I don't think he's the water dragon. As before, he needs a constellation. If he's the water dragon, he's from the light realm, so he wouldn't have one. But also the water dragon is dead, and he's going to come back as a human in Ankanomiya, which has been sealed ever since the Archon War, and only the hero of Watatsumi Island could go in and out to gather the Blood Branch Coral. Now, in Genshin Impact, there are two different kinds of information. Something said by an NPC, Xavier talked about the countless gorgeous maidens in the core of Fontaine, ethereal as the clouds themselves, which never came true, unless he was talking about the Melusine. But although really cute, they are just anthropomorphic slugs. And then there's something written in a book, especially if it's a very important one, like the Baptismal Bishop Experimental Records, in which Orobashi himself wrote about the prophecy of the water dragon, and about his experiments on the bishops to change their elements and prevent a Hydro Bishop to be born again. It's too specific and detailed to be ignored, so in my opinion, Nevillette is not the water dragon. On the other hand, we do know of a very aggressive race born of the sea that the Rumurian called dragons, and we also know that the last of their descendants made a peaceful agreement with the last archer knight from Rumuria, and together they created a settlement somewhere else. It is still a dragon. It has a connection with bishops because Scylla recruited them to fight, it wields Hydro since it's born from the sea, and because of that, he would have a constellation. 
Also, the dragon from the story created a new city, and Villette seems to be a mix of Neuf or Neuf, which means new, and Villette, little city. So, new little city. Just like the one the dragon created with the archer. Now, I guess you've noticed that we've received an almost infinite amount of lore, but nowhere was ever mentioned when our influencer Furina became the Archon or that it even happened. She probably became an Archon at the same time or even after Nahida. Yes, Ganyu said that the youngest Archon was Nahida, but then again, she said the youngest, not the last one to become an Archon. It's different. Now, the original Hydro Archon was an Oceanid, and there is a legend of her shedding a tear from which a new Oceanid was born. Egeria wanted this new Oceanid, capable of metamorphosis, to understand and love humans and eventually yearn for life. If that legend is based on real events, then Farina would be the Hydro Archon's actual daughter, and she would be less than 2000 years old. During the Cataclysm, the Hydro Archon went to Karya with the director of the Nazisenkreutz Institute and other Oceanids, and only the director came back. She may have told Furina about her mother's death. Furina lost it, got upset with the Oceanids for not being able to protect her, and since the water changes according to the emotions of an Oceanid, the water became, like Idia said, full of hatred and pain, forcing the Oceanids to leave. Why would they consider Furina as their god at this point? They also started believing that Farina will send assassin after them, like Rodea says, but since there are no Oceanids in Fontaine, who would these assassins even be? Now, Farina's behavior is not an act, because we saw her thoughts during the Archon quest, and she really is a brat who just pretends to be right or righteous even when she's completely wrong. She doesn't act like an Archon, let alone the God of Justice, and the people don't even respect her, although most of the time they don't even have a mind of their own. They just agree with whoever has the upper hand. Whoops, sorry, wrong clip. They're not that different from Farina, they just pretend to be righteous. But we've also seen a different side of Farina. She's actually scared of the prophecy, and she's trying to find a solution to this enigma that, because of the premature death of the original Hydro Archon, fell right on her shoulders, just like maybe her ascension as an Archon. Now to end this video, I would like to talk about something really interesting. Farina's voice in the Fountain of Lucine. First of all, the insignia on the fountain says May no spring, no fountain ever run dry. May the torrent of life wash the valley grey, the mountain high into end time nigh. This seems to be a wish against the apocalypse, since Rene said that the water will dry up and all life will end. Now, she says that it's interminable, that she's lonely and wonders how much longer. I have two theories, but tell me what you think in the comment section. She's the only Oceanid left in Fontaine, so she's either waiting for the water to be purified, so that the other Oceanids would come back unaware that they're extremely scared of her, or she's waiting for the water to be purified so the new Oceanids could be born, so her loneliness would finally end. Either way, it feels like she's unwillingly complicating every single trial to earn more power from the people's belief in justice. Maybe she needs in the Nidium to finally end her loneliness or to prevent the prophecy, or maybe she was convinced to do so by Arlecchino. And that's it, I hope you liked the video. If you did, don't forget to leave a thumbs up, and if you're interested in Genshin Impact Theory videos, consider subscribing. Very quickly, next week I'll upload a short video about a few more things I want to talk about, like the new Natland lore that we finally got. Anyway, thanks for watching, and until next time, over and out.